He said, um, tomorrow is Sunday, and he said, some friends of mine here at college and myself, we're going to go to Robert Schuler's church. And I said, Charles, why are you going to do that? And he goes, well, Mom, we just want to check it out and see what it's all about. And uh, I said, okay. So he went, and I remember contacting him either that afternoon and that the next day, I can't remember. And I asked him, I said, so tell me about it. What was it like, you know, except I knew about the, the glass all around, and I knew some of, some of Robert Schuler's theology. And he said, Mom, it was really weird. And he began to tell me some of the stuff. And he said, we actually sang a song, How Great I Am. I said, you did? I hope you didn't sing it. How great I am? Of course, it's not surprising when you consider Robert Schuller's theology. Thankfully, he's now 88 and retired, but we have others that are following his footsteps. Robert Schuller doesn't believe in sermons because he feels they're offensive. And when my son told me about what was taught that day, I thought, oh my goodness. He deliberately avoids condemning people for sin. In fact, here is his definition of sin. Sin is any act or any thought that robs myself or another human being of his or her self-esteem. That is sin, according to Robert Schuller. He also encourages Christian and non-Christians alike to achieve great things through God and to believe in your dreams. And he believes, get this, he even wrote a book about it, if you can dream it, you can do it. He also, you like this, he defines salvation as a change from a negative to a positive self-image, from inferiority to self-esteem, from fear to love, and from doubt to trust. So, great theology, right? Quite a contrast from what the Apostle of Paul would say about sin, about himself, and about salvation. So let's listen in as we read 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 17, and ladies, note the contrast between Paul the Apostle's theology and Robert Schuller and other like him today who are teaching the same theology. Let's look at verse 12 to 17. Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtain mercy that in me, first Jesus Christ, might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for life everlasting. Now unto the King, immortal, eternal, invisible, the only wise God, our Savior, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Quite a contrast, right? Well, our title of our lesson tonight is called Amazing Grace That Saved a Wretch Like Paul, and we have a fourfold outline here for us this evening. First of all, we're going to see Paul's thankful heart in verse 12, Paul's thankful heart. Secondly, Paul's wicked past, Paul's wicked past in verse 13. Thirdly, God's abundant grace, God's abundant grace in verses 14 through 16, and then last, number four, God's awesome attributes. God's awesome attributes, verse 17. So Paul's thankful heart, his wicked past, God's abundant grace, God's awesome attributes. Now, in our last lesson, we learned together that there is a wrong use of the law, which is God's word, and a right use of the law. We learned that the wrong use of the law would be using it for getting caught up in foolish talk, or as Paul said last week, fables and endless genealogies. And we saw that these foolish pursuits lead to arguments. But we also learned there's a right use of the law, the right use of God's word. And that is for the purpose of getting caught up in wise talk, which leads to loving other people and to godly edification. And so Paul has just talked about the glorious gospel. Remember, we ended it on that in verse 11. He talked about the glorious gospel. And so evidently, the mentioning of the glorious gospel reminds the Apostle Paul of the fact that this glorious gospel has saved him. And it's given him a purpose. And the purpose is giving his life back to the Lord who saved him. 
Now, maybe you think it's odd when you read 1 Timothy chapter 1 that sandwiched in between talking about false teachers, because next week as we end chapter 1, we're going to look at Hymenaeus and Alexander who defected from the faith, and we talked about false teaching last week, and all of a sudden, right in the middle of this, sandwiched in between false teachers, Paul all of a sudden breaks out and talks about his personal testimony of salvation. But, when you think about it, it's not so strange. It's as if Paul is writing to Timothy and the church at Ephesus and to you and I that the right use of the law, the glorious gospel, transforms your life. It doesn't lead you into getting caught up in false teaching or false teachers. In fact, just this week I had a conversation with two different individuals and we were talking about one gal in particular. She said, you know, this girl, she was so dedicated in this church, and now she's become a Roman Catholic. And I said, well, that puts her salvation in question, doesn't it? Because 1 John is very clear that genuine believers overcome false teachers. Then I was talking to another gal the same week, and she was talking about some family members that have gotten caught up in the prosperity gospel, who at one time were in a sound church. And I said, well, that says a lot about them. I would question the validity of their salvation. Salvation, because the Bible says, again in 1 John, that those of us who know Christ, what? We overcome false <coughs> teachers. Ladies, false teachers know nothing of the grace of God that Paul had experienced. And last week when we looked at all those sins, Paul could certainly have placed himself in the list of sins we looked at last time. And Paul has a thankful heart as evidenced by his opening statement. Look at verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. Now, notice first of all in verse 12. Who is Paul thankful to? It's okay, you can talk out. Christ Jesus. Now, Rarely do we hear false teachers. I want you to tune into them and see if you can find this to be true. I have rarely heard a false teacher give thanks to God. More often what you hear is praise to themselves and telling stories about themselves, about their own ability or how clever they are or how much God told them and talked to them and did this for them. But not Paul. He makes no mention of himself. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. And it's very interesting, the Greek rendering here is a constant thankfulness. Paul says, I continually thank God for my salvation. Ladies, that is a rebuke to you and to me. I mean, this past week, did you thank God every day for your salvation? I can't. I can tell you that I did not. Not every day. But Paul says, I continually thank God for my salvation and for what he has done. Now, Paul goes on to mention, he says, I'm thankful that God enabled me, putting me in the ministry. Now, what does the word enable mean? The word enable means to empower or to give someone ability or strength. Ladies, Paul knew that this was not some inner strength that he possessed, okay? As Robert Schuller would say, it's not some inner strength. That enabling came from God and God alone. And ladies, that same enabling is in you and in me. God is the one who enables us to do anything without him we can do nothing. Now, he goes on to write, he says, I was counted faithful, which means I was considered as trustworthy. Now, this does not mean, listen very carefully, this does not mean that God chose Paul based on his worthiness, okay? None of us is worthy. There is none righteous. No, not one. As Augustine says, God does not choose anyone who is worthy, but in choosing him, he renders him worthy. And so there's nothing in us that we're not that clever and that worthy and that noble that God would choose us. Now, of course, there is a sense after salvation, after our conversion, that ladies, we are to be faithful to do the work that God has called us to do. In fact, Paul will tell Timothy in his second epistle, he said, he'll tell Timothy, he says, Timothy, you pass on the things that I have taught you to faithful men 
men that are faithful, men that are trustworthy, who will be able to teach other faithful men. Ladies, faithfulness is essential in the work of the Lord, and Paul was faithful. Can God say that about you? Are you faithful in the things that he's called you to do? Do others say that about you? You know, I was talking to a gal uh, the other day, and I said, well, why don't you ask that person if they see this in you? You know, maybe, maybe ask your husband, ask your best friend, do you think I'm faithful? Am I faithful in the things that God has called me to do? Paul was trustworthy. He was faithful. He says to be put into the ministry. You might say, well, wow, that's really, you know, glorious to be put in the ministry. Not. You know what the Greek word for ministry is? Servant. Slave. Waiting on others like waiters wait on your table when you go out to eat. Now, there's nothing worthy about that, right? They're servants, even though some of them try to sit at the table with you, you know, while they're taking your order, but they're supposed to be waiting on you. That's why you tip them, because they're supposed to be serving you. There's nothing self-glorying about that. Paul's not trying to elevate himself. He says, I am counted faithful to be put as in the ministry as a servant, as a slave. Ladies, our ministry is to benefit others, not us. Jesus himself said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That's why Jesus came. He didn't want to be served. He didn't want to be elevated. He didn't want his self-esteem built up. He came to minister and to serve. So I ask, are you pouring your life out in whatever the Lord wants you to do? Are you a faithful table waiter? Are you a servant? Ladies, we should think often of our life before Christ and examine our wretchedness. We need to remember from where we've come, as, as my friend Charlotte would say, from whence we come. We need to remember from where we have come and what God has done to save a wretch like us. Maybe that will put our lives in perspective for faithful service. Well, Paul had a thankful heart. Do you have a thankful heart? Are you thankful for your salvation? Thankful that God considered you faithful to put you into service to serve him? Well, Paul evidently remembered often his life before Christ, as mentioned in verse 13, as we turn from his thankful heart to his wicked past. He says, oh, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man. Now, ladies, we should make a serious notation. Look at your Bible very carefully. Paul says he was formerly involved in all these things, not currently involved. This was who he was before Christ. My friend, we need to remember we are not bound to sin. Christ has come to set us free. Ladies, sin has no longer a mastery over us. If the gospel has had no transforming power in your life to change you from a wretched sinner, it has had no transforming power, then I would question the validity of your salvation because there should be a life change. In fact, Paul makes it clear in several places that if we think we can retain our sin and have everlasting life, then we're mistaken. Listen to Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, factions, heresies, seditions, envyings, murderers, and the like, of which I've told you before, Paul says, and I'm telling you again, those who practice these things, those who do these things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those are things we formerly did. We don't practice those things now. Also, again, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then Paul says, don't be deceived about this. And then he has a list of sins again. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But then the beauty, he says, and such were some of you. <laughs> 
Formerly, just like me, Paul says, such were some of you, but now you're washed, you're clean, you are sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Ladies, we cannot pretend uh, to say that I am a Christian and still hold on to those sins that we've committed before Christ. Paul says, I was formerly these things, not currently. And then he lists some of the sins, three exactly, even though Christ saved him from other sins, but these are three, I guess, that stood out to Paul. Notice the first one. He says he was a blasphemer. What's a blasphemer? A blasphemer is someone who slanders and abuses others with their speech. And particularly here, Paul blasphemed the Lord. In fact, I thought it was very interesting the same day that my father's obituary was in the paper and the religious section ran an article about his life. I don't know if any of you saw that, but when I went to go pick up a couple of papers, I noticed on the front page of the Tulsa World was an article about the satanic mass that they were holding in Oklahoma City. Did anybody see that? And I mean, it was really creepy. I go, what a contrast between this guy and my dad. But anyway, this guy was holding uh, the Church of Satan last weekend, if you didn't know about it. They were holding a black mass in Oklahoma City. And I read the article, and basically what they were doing, they were denouncing Jesus Christ, swearing allegiance to the devil, and blaspheming the name of Jesus Christ. That's what was going to take place last weekend in Oklahoma City. And I was so thankful when I read more on the article that uh, they only had about half the people that they were expecting to attend. And so, ladies, that's what Paul says. I was, I was blaspheming. I blasphemed the name of God. Of course, he, uh, if you're not serving God, you're serving Satan, right? Even though he didn't have a black mask, but he could have very well fallen in this category. Secondly, notice the second thing he did. He says he was a persecutor. He was a persecutor. It's interesting, this is the only time this word is found in the New Testament. And it describes someone who chases Christians like they do wild animals. So that's a very vivid picture. In fact, in Acts 8.3, Paul says this, I destroyed the church going from house to house dragging men and women out of their houses and putting them in prison. He was chasing Christians like wild animals. Thirdly, notice the third thing. He says he was an insolent man, an insolent man. Now, this is the strongest of the three Greek terms, and it means that Paul was proud, malicious. He was outraged. In fact, if you remember before Paul, when he was before King Agrippa in Acts 26, he says this about himself. He says, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints I shut up in prison, I having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. He was enraged. He was insolent. And you might look at Paul's life before Christ and you might say, man, this guy needs to be locked up in prison. Or, you know, this guy needs to join up with ISIS because that's what they enjoy doing, dragging people out of their houses and beheading them and killing them. There's this guy, there is no hope for him. But ladies, nothing could be further from the truth. Because with Christ, there is always hope. There is no sin that you and I have committed that is too enormous for Christ to forgive. He forgives them all, and there's always hope with him. In fact, this was illustrated to me just a few weeks ago when I was in the doctor's office with my husband who was receiving the first of his eye injections for his retinopathy that he has because of diabetes. And I remember the lady was preparing him for his first injection, the doctor's assistant, and she said, you know, she said, before this drug came out three years ago, we could offer no hope to those who were going blind. And she said they would come into the office, we would do the test on their eyes, and we would say, you can't drive anymore, and you're going blind. 
there was no hope. But she says now we can offer hope because of this new medication. And I thought, you know, that's the same way it is in the spiritual sense. Before Christ came, there was no hope. Ladies, we were blind. We could not see spiritually. But now, because Christ has come, there's hope. And there was hope for Paul, and there is hope for you and for me. In fact, Paul goes on to say, he said, I obtained mercy. Even though I was an insolent, I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, he says, I obtained mercy. Why? Because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, Paul is not excusing his sin, okay? He himself would say, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the least of the apostles. But what he is saying is this, I didn't know what I was doing. I was ignorant. I was ignorant. Paul defines this somewhat in Romans 10, 3 and 4. He says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness went about seeking their own righteousness. Or it's very similar to what Christ said on the cross. Father, forgive them. Why? They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> they don't know what they're doing. They're ignorant. Or it's as if Paul would say in 2 Corinthians to those who crucified our Savior. He says in 1 Corinthians 2.8, None of the rulers of this age knew this, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They were ignorant. They did not know. They were ignorant and they were in unbelief, just like the Apostle Paul. So he says, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Well, Paul knew that where his sin abounded, grace even abounded more. And so he goes on to write about God's abundant grace in verses 14 to 16. Notice what he says. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which was in Christ Jesus. Ladies, grace was shown to Paul just like it was shown to you on the day that you embraced Christ. And just like it was shown to me on the day that I embraced Christ. What is grace? Grace is undeserved favor shown to a guilty sinner. Undeserved favor shown to a guilty sinner. A song we used to sing when I was growing up in the Baptist church was, we don't sing it very often anymore, marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Ladies, that's grace, marvelous grace of our loving Lord. In fact, Paul goes on to say God's grace was not just abundant, but notice what he says exceedingly abundant this means it was super abundant and along with this grace notice what else he says is the faith and love which is in Christ Jesus you know it's interesting Paul mentioned three of his gross sins and now he mentions three of God's gracious attributes I don't know if there was any Paul likes triads I don't you'll notice that through first Timothy he likes things in three so I don't know when we get to heaven we can ask him maybe my dad's asking him right now what that's all about but he did mention three of his gross sins and now he's mentioning three of God's gracious attributes and Paul goes on to write about the grace of God in verse 15 he says this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief Paul says this is a true saying this is true and it's worthy for everyone to accept now what is a true saying what is the saying that we all should embrace? That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. In fact, it is said that this verse right here was a fragment of a hymn that they would sing in the early church. Now, we don't sing songs like this, do we? It's a faithful saying, the word Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. You know, we don't like those kind of songs. But this was part of a hymn that they would say, sing. In fact, along with 1 Timothy 3, 1, 1 Timothy 4, 9, 2 Timothy 2, 11, Titus 3, 8, they all start out like that. This is a faithful saying. This is a faithful saying. We'll get into one in chapter 3. This is a faithful saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good thing. And that was also a song. I don't know why they sang that, but that, that was something they sang. 1 Timothy 4 is another one. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, talking about the living God. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.11, this is a faithful saying. If we die with him, we live with him. If we suffer with him, we'll reign with him. That was another fragment of a hymn they sang. The last one in Titus 3.8, this is a faithful saying. 
And these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to all men. So these are just a kind of fragments of hymns that they used to sing, and they start out with saying, this is a faithful saying, this is a worthy saying. In fact, it's interesting here when Paul says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. It's very similar to what the Apostle John said on the first time he saw Jesus. Remember what he said in John chapter 1? Behold the Lamb of God, what? Who takes away the sin of the world. Ladies, John and Paul are a far cry from our culture. Our culture minimizes sin. We rationalize our sin. We excuse our sin away. But not John and not Paul. They realized that they were sinners and they needed a Savior. Well, Paul goes on to mention yet another aspect of God's grace in verse 16. Notice what he says. He says, However, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for life everlasting. Ladies, Paul obtained mercy for this reason. Notice the reason. That the long suffering of Christ might be shown to all who believe. Now, obviously, this is not the only reason that Paul obtained mercy, okay? But it's the one he mentions here. Why? The long suffering of Christ would mean he was showing his forbearance towards the Apostle Paul, even though he was insolent, even though he was a blasphemer, even though he was a persecutor. In fact, Paul writes of God's, God's patience in many places, but Romans 2, 14, he says, Do you not despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, knowing that the goodness of God leads us to repentance? And even Peter writes this in 2 Peter 3, 15. He says that consider the long suffering of our Lord in salvation. And he goes on to say, as our beloved brother Paul has written about Ladies, Paul wasn't saved for Paul. Paul was saved for God's glory and so that God's long suffering would be a pattern for you and I, for those who would believe after. You might say, well, how's that? Ladies, God's patience was clearly seen in the salvation of a wretch like Paul. And God's patience and long-suffering is clearly seen to save a wretch like me and like you. In fact, when I think of my life before Christ, sometimes I think I've shared this before, I think I could real, probably throw up. I, I don't even like to think about my life before Christ because it was so horrible. Yet God was patient towards me. He was, and so was my husband. <laughs> he was long suffering. In fact, I've always, I've often wanted to ask him why did he stay in the marriage, but uh, not God, but my husband. But his patience was clearly shown towards me in all of those years that I was living a life of hypocrisy and sin. And Paul says it was seen for a pattern to those who were going to believe on him for life everlasting. What would that be? Well, a pattern would be a sample, which be, would be an encouragement to those in the future who believe. Ladies, you and I and others can look at the life of the Apostle Paul, and it should encourage us, should encourage us shouldn't it? If God can save a murderer, right? And we know the Bible says no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. If God can save a murderer, he can save us, Right? If God can save, save King David, even though he was a murderer and an adulterer, God can save us, right? If God can save Rahab the prostitute, do you think God can save you and I and the others? You know, Paul says in another place, whatever things were written in the past were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. And so as we look at these examples in the Old and New Testament of wicked sinners, wicked men and wicked women who came to faith in Jesus Christ, doesn't that give us hope? It encourages us. There's no sin too great that God cannot forgive. If God can save them, he can save us, and he can save, as Paul says, those who will believe on him 
in the future to life everlasting. Well, as Paul reflects on this great salvation that was offered to him, he breaks out in a doxology of praise to this glorious God. Paul does this often, sometimes in the middle of the letter, sometimes in the beginning of the letter. He breaks out in this in glorious doxology of praise to God, and he mentions several of God's attributes. Notice God's awesome attributes in verse 17. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Ladies, again, notice and look very carefully at verse 17. It is worthy to note Paul gives God all the glory for saving him. He says nothing about himself. You know, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. No, he didn't. God gets all the glory. Ladies, true as it may be that God uses men and women to share the gospel and to be mouthpieces for him, God gets all the glory. And notice, Paul doesn't say, unto me, now unto me be all glory. But he says, unto the king. He doesn't say how great I am. He says how great he is. In fact, he says this king is eternal. What does that mean? It means he has no end. He has no beginning. I was thinking about this as I was looking at my wedding ring. My wedding ring has no beginning and no end. I can't find the beginning and I can't find the end. In fact, my former wedding ring got stolen. So this, is, this was the second set. My first one got stolen out of our house. But this ring has no beginning and no end. It's, and that's the way God is. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is eternal. Secondly, Paul says he's immortal. What does that mean? He's imperishable. He's incorruptible. He doesn't decay. Ladies, sometimes I get up and look in the mirror and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what has happened to you? And in fact, as I've been getting pictures together for my dad's uh, memorial service Sunday night, I'm looking at pictures of eons ago. I'm like, oh my goodness, what happened to you? And, uh, you know, things are going south, they're going bigger, and they're going grayer. And, and uh, in fact, the other day, my husband, you know, he's just had surgery, and he says, is this what it's like getting old? I mean, do we just have a surgery every other year, and, you know, we're just kind of checking out? And uh, we're decaying. We are decaying. Our bodies are falling apart. But not the Lord, not our Savior, not our God. He doesn't decay. He doesn't have to have surgery. Isn't that great? He doesn't get gray. His body's not going south or getting bigger. He's incorruptible. He's also invisible. What does that mean? It means no one can see him. Ladies, the Bible is clear. No matter how many people will tell you they've seen God, the Bible says no man has seen God at any time. No one has. Now, we can see him through creation. Romans 1 says that we can see him through creation, so much so that those that don't hear the gospel are without excuse because they can look at creation and know that it is made by the eternal Godhead. But he is invisible. We cannot see him. And then he says, and your translation might be a little different than some, he says that God who alone is wise, and it actually reads in the Greek, the only God, it actually leaves out the wise. So the only God would be that there are no other gods. He alone is the only God. But if your translation says wise, um, I'm stealing from Steve Lawson, who we're listening to on Sunday night here as we're going through the attributes of God. But his definition of God's wisdom was so great, I thought it was probably the best one I could use. But when we think about God's wisdom, I love this definition. His choices pursue the highest end. When we think about God's wisdom, his wisdom, his choices pursue the highest end. And Steve Lawson went on to say how we can see God's wisdom in three specific areas. Not that these are the only three, but in creation. Ladies, when you think about who could do that? Who could have created the heavens and the earth and the flowers and the trees and all the animal species? Only God. His wisdom is seen in creation. Secondly, he says God's wisdom is seen in salvation. Who could come up with that kind of plan? I can't explain it as good as Steve Lawson. But the plan for salvation, who could think of that? Nobody. But God did. So we see his wisdom in salvation. And lastly, he mentioned we can see God's wisdom in providence. In this sovereignty. In fact, I was just telling someone the other day, I said, when I look at my life in the last few months and every, all the events that have taken place, 
I said, I just cannot get over the providence of God. I could not have planned the timing for all these things better. I mean, God's wisdom is seen in providence and in his sovereignty. So he's eternal, he's immortal, he's invisible, and he is the only wise God. And then Paul ends his doxology with, to him be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. For all eternity, for Paul, he would experience life everlasting with the one who receives glory forever, the King eternal. Well, Paul's thankful heart in verse 12, Paul's heart showed forth by Paul's mouth, giving thanks to God for what he had done in granting him salvation. Ladies, do you have a thankful heart, especially as it relates to the fact that God has saved you? If your heart is not thankful, your mouth will not be thankful either. Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When is the last time you thanked God for saving your soul? I have to say, as I remember my dad, that is one of the things I can say. He was a thankful man. Not only for his salvation, I told you the story about the banana. I mean, he's thankful for everything. My friend Carolyn said, I can remember him thanking, being so thankful for the new paint on the wall in the veteran's home. He was a thankful man. Paul had a grateful heart. Secondly, we saw Paul's wicked past in verse 13. Ladies, Paul mentions before Christ, he was a blasphemer, he was a persecutor, he was an insolent man. What was your life before Christ? Were you a liar? A cheater, a stealer, a rebel, sexually perverse, a murderer, whatever it was, no sin is too awful for God's mercy. Thirdly, we see God's abundant grace in verses 14 to 16. God's grace was super abundant in Paul's life, and my friend, it is super abundant in your life. Do you think about that? Do you dwell on God's grace? By the way, when's the last time that you shared God's amazing grace with somebody, the amazing gospel? And then lastly, God's awesome attributes. Paul finishes his journey in salvation by praising God for his attributes. He's eternal, he's immortal, he's invisible. What attributes of God stand out in your mind as you dwell on your salvation? Well, Paul's heart is a far cry from the heart of Robert Schuller and many other false teachers. Paul's heart revealed it had been changed and transformed by the power of God. Paul understood the amazing grace of God that saved a wretch like him. Most of us know John Newton, who wrote the words, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I'm blind, but now I see. And John Newton was much like the Apostle Paul. In fact, it was said of him until the time of his death at the age of 82 that John Newton never ceased to marvel at the grace of God that completely transformed him. And shortly before his death, he was preaching a message, I guess one of his last messages that he ever preached. And he was quoted as proclaiming with a loud voice during this message. My memory is nearly gone, but I can remember two things. That I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you so much for saving us. We thank you for delivering us from these wretched sins that even Paul mentions. Lord, we might say, well, I didn't murder anybody. But, Father, we did. We've murdered in our heart. We've hated in our heart. And we know your words equates hatred with murder. And we might say, well, I never pulled anybody out of their house and was enraged. But, Father, we've had rage in our heart. And maybe in our lips we've been enraged. And we've committed sins just as bad as Paul and David and Rahab. And Father, we thank you that you have come in and changed our life with the glorious gospel, that it has had life-transforming power, and that you have transferred us from darkness into the marvelous light and the kingdom of the Son that you love, as Paul says in Colossians. We look forward, Father, to that final day when our, our bodies will be transformed and we will no longer have the remnants of the old man in our flesh that still wants to 
do the wrong thing. The good that we want to do, we don't do, and the bad, we still end up doing. And we look forward and we can be complete and without sin. In glory in heaven with you forever. Pray that you will use this lesson to encourage the hearts of those who might think that they have committed some unpardonable sin, Lord, that there is no sin too great for you to forgive. And I pray this in the Savior's name and for his sake. Amen.